Thank you very much, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's really an honor to be here. I'm really happy to give this talk, and together with these other faculties who already basically told you everything about intelligence, now I'm going to fill some gap talking about brain connectivity. And let's see if this works. Great. So uh, this is the outline of my talk. So as you can see, there are three main components. Basically, when we talk about the neuroscience of intelligence, you can start with the basic knowledge about what intelligent is, but I think we already heard a lot about this from Maria Angeles and, and others. So I will skip this part, and I will try to work on these other two components. So one is the study of brain connectivity, both at the neurophysiological and neuroimaging level, using functional MRI or electroencephalography, for instance, or magnetoencephalography. And the other approach that I'm gonna talk to you about is non-invasive brain stimulation. So I'm putting all these uh, things together because I think uh, the common factor here is brain plasticity. So my decision about combining these two is a way to try to compensate for the lack of knowledge when you look at about correlation of cognitive functions or pathological states just at this level. So you have correlational evidence. You can see that this correlates with this, but you don't know anything about the casual uh, causal inference about who is going to determine the other factor. Non-invasive brain stimulation is a good opportunity to test this hypothesis just by uh, decreasing the activity of a region, increasing the activity of a network, and so on. So I think it's a good combination also to uh, study uh, intelligence in general. But let's start from, from here, which is the big question. And I think this reminds of some slides from the um, genetic presentation yesterday. So who are we? I think this is the, the reason why we are here. We want to study intelligence, and intelligence is just a way to talk about individual differences, why we are all different one from the other. And when you think about the first thing that can explain these differences, clearly uh, the DNA, our genetic uh, uh, factors. And as you can see, there are a couple of milestone points in the history of this kind of approach. In 1953, uh, four scientists published the first evidence of the structure of the DNA, and only 50 years after that, they were able to, not the same scientists clearly, but just they contributed to map the entire human genome, um, uh, and so to give an idea about why this complex uh, pattern of, of uh, molecules can explain individual variability in cognitive uh, uh, in the cognitive profile, in pathological states, and so on. But the idea is that uh, probably this is not enough. So when we talk about intelligence, we should talk about other factors. So the answer to this, I think, at least for me, is to look at uh, not only genomics, but also connectomics. So the idea is to move from the uh, study of the DNA to the study of the brain connectome. And as you can see here, there is uh, a couple of big projects about this. Uh, both in Europe and both in the US. This is the Human Connectome Project from four major universities in the US. Basically, the idea is to study uh, uh, two aspects of the brain. So we can also focus on the structural properties of the brain, so the geometry in the brain, how the brain works, because it's uh, composed by different uh, neurons, by different fibers, and we can map all the different tracks, and so have an idea about the backbone of the brain, it's like uh, studying the structure of uh, a car. Uh, when you move to the functional uh, part, you can actually study the activity of the brain, and you can study how these different regions uh, cooperate to make each individual uh, express his own cognitive profile and have higher or lower fluid intelligence or working memory and so on. So these two approaches are clearly complementary. We should study both. But what I'm going to talk to you about is more on this side, so the functional uh, patterns in the brain. So when we talk about this, we can start from this very first slide. So this is the first evidence about the, the application of functional imaging in humans. The, the first paper published on science in 1991 about the first functional activation in the human uh, occipital cortex uh, while a subject was seeing the flickering lights on a screen. So this was the first evidence of the fact that we can actually map act neuronal activity in the brain by using these imaging methods. And as you can see, a lot has been done in terms of increasing the spatial accuracy of this kind of technique. So today, instead of having these uh, rough uh, estimates of activity, we can actually decompose the occipital cortex in different patterns and see the activity of different layer in the cortex and so on. So we can really be extremely precise about this. But the problem with this is that here we are still focusing about the activity of the brain. So that's the main uh, interest. We look at, uh, about brain activity when people are doing something. But what has really changed in the last 10 years in modern neuroscience is the focus of attention. So we are also looking now at spontaneous brain activity. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this concept, so 
I also included a couple of slides about this to create a, a common background. Uh, basically, when we talk about spontaneous brain activity, we talk about the idea that uh, till, I think, 1999 or year 2000, we were assuming that apart from when you do something, so you do this inside the MRI scanner, or you think about a series of number, uh, your brain in the rest of the time is just full of noise. It's just doing random stuff. And basically the activity of different regions are not organized. So you, we should not actually pay attention to this kind of activity. We should just skip that part and focus on the real difference between all of us, which is expressed when we actually do something. Uh, a couple of scientists actually demonstrated that that's not the case. So if you look at the brain at rest and you try to decompose the signal, you see that our brain at rest is actually decomposed in different networks, which are actually uh, composed by regions that are part of the same domain, the same system. So regions like the two motor cortices, which are not supposed to do anything while you are laying in the fMRI scan, scanner and you're not doing anything, you're thinking about last summer or your next exam, you're not moving actually they are actually talking with each other. So the motor network is still activated like this one. And so this was some kind of a surprising evidence why the brain should do this. It's, it's, it requires a lot of energy, a lot of oxygen to do this, and we are not actually doing anything at that moment. But then we discovered that also the visual cortex is doing the same, the auditory cortex, higher order uh, uh, networks are doing the same, the network for executive attention, the network for working memory. We don't know at the time, we didn't know why, but these regions are actually talking with each other. So the idea is that at rest, our brain is oscillating through time at a very slow pace, and this low oscillation basically are um, representing a, a, a kind of activity like the one that you can think of when a tennis player is waiting for the opponent to serve at the beginning of each match. So basically, you, you, you will never see a tennis player just stay still like this with the racket and wait. They usually move from left to right. So the idea is that if you do this, you are more ready to catch the ball even if it comes to the right, to the left, in the front, in the middle, everywhere, because you are already activated. So this is an evolutionary way for the brain to, to create some kind of ongoing pattern of activity that keep this region already activated. And so when you actually do something, you start doing something, just to rearrange a couple of connections, but the gross activation is already there. So it's a very, very intelligent way for the brain to, uh, to give us the opportunity to do everything we do. If you want another explanation, which I think is striking about the importance of this thing, it still reminds of evolution, which you know, tends to uh, encourage uh, behavior and patterns that are actually good for us. So if you think about the brain at rest, what the brain does when you're actually not doing anything, like in this case, you're just relaxing on a beach, your brain, even though it's like one kilogram and a half, it's really uh, covered a small part of our body weight, requires 20% of our metabolic demand. Just to stay still like this, your brain wants one-fifth of your metabolic demand. So you should ask yourself, what happened when I actually do something? When I do something very complicated like uh, surgery, or I don't know, uh, pilot uh, um, an Airbus, an airplane, or I pilot uh, an F1 car. So now I'm asking you, what do you think? What, what uh, is the size of the change between this 20% in this state and this kind of activation? Do you think the brain switched from 20% to, I don't know, 40%? How many of you think that? Raise your hand. 30%? Fifty percent? More than double? I don't know, say number, seventy, eight. So this is the answer. We can make it quicker. So the answer is five percent. Just five percent. So your brain requires just an increase in five percent of activity to do all this combination of different patterns, behavioral patterns, instead of doing this. But the tricky part and the most interesting thing is that this is not the five percent of the entire metabolic demand of your body. This is 5% of this 20%. So basically the body is switching from 20% to 21. So the brain requires everything it needs to do everything already when you are in these states. And then when you ask yourself, look, let's, let's do a spacewalk on the International Space Station. The brain just changed a couple of connections, require more sugar here, more sugar there, oxygen, and it's ready to do everything. So this is a, a very, very striking uh, and intriguing idea about why the brain is wired this way and it works this way. And maybe that's the idea. We should look in this direction to find differences in intelligence because this, at this point, we can see constitutes a very large uh, part of our individual variability and it's an important contribution to cognition for sure. 
So if you want another example, it's, it's a very nice paper in Nature Neuroscience published, I think, five months ago, four months ago, from the Human Connectome Project. Basically what they did, they wanted to find source of individual variability in connectivity. So what really makes the brain different from one to the other? So they have these subjects scanned during rest condition when they were not doing anything inside the scanner and different um, task conditions. So they were doing a motor task or a working memory task, a language task and so on. They extracted the activity from different parts of the brain and what they were searching for was pattern of uh, connection that were basically highly variable across subjects and pattern of connection that were almost always the same between individuals. So they were able to identify these two patterns of connectivities in the brain. This is the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. So when you look at 100 subjects, 200 subjects, 1,000 subjects, you see that all the subjects usually show these kind of connectivities. They're all similar across individuals. But then there are connectivities that actually change. And they're probably responsible for our individual differences at the phenotype level. But what is really interesting and was really interesting in this paper is that if you really want to classify people and say, okay, subject one is really different from the other 99 and subject two is different from the other 99 and so on, you can compare the accuracy that you get when you look at task activity. So your brain doing something, your brain doing nothing, your brain doing something plus uh, the activity. So the combination of the two. And if you look at the accuracy level, you see that actually it's easier to discriminate subject when you look at the resting state activity than when you look at task activity which is the opposite. When you think about why I'm different from other people, because I can do things differently. No, probably if I want to look at the difference, I should look at your brain while you're not doing an anything. So this is the opposite of what we actually would think. So that's the reason why we, we look at brain connectivity. I think it's, it's a good uh, source of information to study intelligence. Uh, clearly we start from the genome, but then we get this idea of the connectome that basically also explain why you can have your talents and you can be uh, more uh, prone to uh, start certain activities or excel in certain areas like be a musician instead of a, uh, an engineer and so on. But the, the most important point is that when you actually perform this activity in a repeated manner, you actually change through brain plasticity processes your connectome. So it's a circle. You continuously change your connectome and by practicing like doing a cognitive training, you actually change these kind of patterns. And these patterns are relevant to study aging. Clearly, we can see some information about, uh, uh, as Stuart showed, uh, what's going on in your brain when you age, and if you can predict how you're going to age or not. We can predict pathology, clearly, and we can focus on this, which is the core of uh, our discussion these two days, so cognitive profile. So let's talk about intelligence now. I think, I hope I didn't scare you. Uh, now I'm going to give you a couple of examples about work we have done to correlate brain connectivity in humans and intelligence variability. Then we will move to the brain stimulation part when I will give you a couple of examples of what we are actually doing to integrate these two things and to hopefully put the field to the, to the next level. So let's talk about brain connectivity and intelligence. Clearly, we are not the first one trying to, to find the correlation between connectivity and intelligence. There are a lot of very, very nice work, like this one I recommend. Uh, there's work uh, showing a huge variability in the findings. So there's people finding um, uh, something like this. So everything, all the variability in fluid intelligence is just related to the activity in one single region that explain everything is the most important part of the brain, left or lateral prefrontal cortex or middle frontal gyrus, I don't remember. Then you have people studying the efficiency of specific regions in the brain, showing that specific uh, neuronal population can actually explain variability in intelligence, and it's just a, not just in one region. There are different blobs here. And so but you, they, diff, they use a completely different metrics. It's efficiency. Here it's just connectivity. Then you have people finding widespread networks, like this frontoparietal one. But I think the best example is this one. So a few years ago, 2007, um, Rex and Young basically publish what is considered the best meta-analysis of evidence about intelligence so far. When you look at all the activation pattern and resting state pattern during uh, PET and, and also using fMRI, you always end up with this pool of region, which as you can see, it's really a parietal frontal network, but also include the temporal lobe, the occipital cortex, a bit of subcortical structures. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a nice solution and gives you an idea of what's the, the template of intelligence in the brain. But as you can see, it's not that specific. So the, 
if I would ask you, okay, which part of the brain is responsible for intelligence, you will always suggest something in the prefrontal lobe, in the parietal lobe, in the visual cortex, or the temporal lobe. So this solves something. It's a good starting point. But what we are trying to do is to use a fancier solution for analysis, which basically rely on uh, complex network theory. The first paper I'm going to show you is um, a controversial one in the sense that when you think about brain connectivity, you always, um, at least the 95% of the literature, focus on the strongest connections in the brain. So when you look at all those connectivities as the one I showed you before, the highly similar connectivity in the brain, the backbone, basically those are the connectivities that are really strong. They have high coefficients of correlation. So you can find those in all the individuals, and they are reliable in the sense that if you scan a subject today, tomorrow, again, three times per day, they're always there and the intensity of the connection is not going to change that much. What we tried to, to, to explore in this paper was actually the opposite. So nobody was talking about weak connections in the brain. So those connections that are actually more flexible, more variable, they can be there, they can decrease their intensity, increase it, and so on. So why study this connect, uh, type of connectivity? Because biology suggests that they are crucial. They're actually the way for complex network to stabilize the activity of the network. So you need the strongest one to compose the network, but with the other, uh, you don't have stability. And weak connections contribute to system evolvability. They improve resilience against attacks. They are fundamental in all type of complex systems, not just the human brain or social networks. So this was something that was the rationale for our exploration. And the way we did it, just to give you an overview of the analysis for those of you who are not familiar, uh, Okay, sorry. So basically when we do this kind of analysis, we take both structural and functional information from each individual. We extract the activity for different anatomical or functional atlases. So you have the main activity of each region in this atlas through time. You have a time course like this. Then you correlate dif using different matrices like mutual information or correlation like Pearson correlation, like the one that we use for st statistical test or psychological test. You correlate the activity of each region with all the others. What you end up with is a connectivity matrix. So basically, it's a colorful uh, visualization of this complex pattern. But basically, if you focus on these four cells here, for example, these colors just represent the intensity of the connection between four different regions. So you have one and two here, the first two. And then you have 20 and 21, I guess. I don't know. I didn't count them. I just put the number. So maybe it's not correct. But as you can see, this red color means that these are highly correlated between each other, 0.45, uh, 0.31, this one, the yellow one. Then you have anti-correlation, negative correlation between this one, minus 38, minus 49. So with a picture, just one single connectivity matrix, you have an idea of why these con different brain regions are connected to each other, if they are actually synchronized, so positively correlated, one goes up, the other goes up, or the opposite, one goes up and the other goes down, because they don't... Uh, need to be synchronized to do something. So this is um, the way we measure this, and I think we can just skip this because it's just a, uh, an example of how we measure this graph theory matrices. And when you apply all these kind of indexes to connectivity matrices calculated at different um, uh, level of intensity of the connectivity, so here you have the strongest connections in the brain, the one that we sh usually look, about, uh, look at, like these two, the ones that are really reliable are always there and so on. Then if you do the same and you extract all these indexes in the very weak connections, which are not so well characterized, what you get is an estimate of the efficiency of this network uh, and the resilience of this network and so on that you can correlate with intelligence. So if you do it, surprisingly, you get this. So strong connections in the brain still are highly correlated, we can say highly, correlated with um, IQ. So you can see this, this region in red are the ones that are positively correlated with each other, and they correlate with full-scale IQ. But what was really surprising in this paper is that when you look at not the super weak connections, but these connections that show a correlation between 0.1 and 0.27, which you, we usually consider noise. We just exclude them from the analysis. They are too low. They're actually super correlated. So the efficiency of these connectivities are more correlated with intelligence than this one. And when you map them, you see this. So these are the strong connections in the brain. 
and these are the weak connections in the brain. So the strong connection are, really looks like the backbone, the eye similarity networks in the other picture. So they connect the same lobe in different hemispheres, like the visual cortex, the temporal lobe, the prefrontal cortex, and so on. They are really short range connections, less than five centimeters sometimes. When you look at weak connection, you see that it's actually a widespread net inside the brain that basically is composed by these weak connections that are highly flexible, and maybe this is a way for the brain to rearrange information on the fly. You can really change this kind of connectivities without a high metabolic demand, because they're uh, uh, poorly correlated. So this was the, the main finding, and we were really, really happy to hear from other, from other scientists about a replication of this finding, both in animal, in the macaque brain, a scientist at the Max Planck in Leipzig, showed the same pattern for structural connectivity. So the structural connectivity in the macaque brain follow the same, the same rule. And then there is a paper about schizophrenia from Bassett showing that if you want to discriminate schizophrenia patient and LT control with functional connectivity, the highest predictive value between the two is you, you get it from super weak connections in the brain, not for the strong one. So we have an insight about why these connections are important, but again, it's just a correlational evidence. Something correlates with something. We don't know if it, they are actually related. So this is the, the first evidence, and one of our students was uh, so happy because she made this picture. I, I gave her the idea, but she, she did the job, and we got the cover of the journal. So then another example, and now we, we, we are going to connect this evidence with something that Stuart mentioned yesterday, because to do this analysis about the correlation between intelligence, functional connectivity, and resilience or longevity in, in, in general, I got really inspired by something. So as I was saying, I got really inspired by this, this commentary on nature by Ian Deary, uh, which is Stuart boss now in, in Edinburgh. And he did an amazing job describing the, the, a couple of hypotheses about why intelligence people tend to live longer. So I was so fascinated about understanding this, this kind of thing. And what, what, what really intrigued me was the more controversial statement that he, that he proposed. So we can think about a lot of explanation. People, more intelligence people, they, they do more exercise. They don't smoke. They, they are good at uh, picking the right food and so on. But what he was proposing is that actually when you look at connectivities uh, correlation between intelligence or cognitive profile and longevity, you always find that this simple reaction time measure is actually the best predictor of longevity, for instance. So this suggests that maybe there's something more than complex cognitive functioning that predicts longevity, for instance. But it's just something about this measure, which represents a basic efficiency in the, in the network, in the brain. So it's a very simple uh, index that you can derive. So maybe we are talking about the relationship not between intelligence, but between a brain that is actually more efficient in general to process information. So how can we actually measure this kind of efficiency? We saw before that we can use graph theory. But what I tried to, to, to push forward here was a way to characterize this resilience against perturbation. So uh, Professor Diri was suggesting that these people are also better at uh, cope with like stroke or, or dementia and so on. So they have an higher probability to cope with this kind of pathological condition. So they can, they can afford more uh, insults, more perturbation. So to test this, I mean, the main hypothesis was that, okay, can we actually try to measure the fitness of the brain, so the, the, the health of the brain? Can we actually find the correlation between this and intelligence? And can this actually explain, for example, cognitive reserve? So the fact that higher intelligence people, they can actually uh, still uh, show uh, a, an intact cognitive profile even though they have a neurodegenerative condition. So to do this, I started from work from, by Barabasi, who is a physicist now in, in Boston. Uh, basically, he proposed this, this kind of approach in nature um, 16 years ago. It was not related to the brain at all. Now he's working on brain stuff too, but at the time he was just interested in complex network in general, and he proposed this framework. So if you want to test for the resilience, the robustness of a system, you can do it in two ways. You can test for random errors like this. So you have your nodes, and then you start deleting one node. You calculate the efficiency and other parameters of the network. Then you delete another one. You recalculate everything, and so on until you have deleted all the nodes. Or you can do it this way. So you basically you rank order the nodes in the brain or the network. You have the most important one first. You delete them. You start for the most connected brain region, for example. Then you delete the second one, the third one, and so on. Each time you get an idea of how the efficiency drop each time that you remove one node from the network. 
So you will have individuals who can actually afford 30 lesions, but they still show the same efficiency level. Other than with just three lesions, they drop and they cannot do anything. So does this, can we map this, and does this correlate with intelligence? So to map it, basically I uh, created all this, those different connectivity matrices. I repeat the same analysis, and each time I perform a random error simulation or a targeted attack simulation, when we start with the most important nodes. I repeat this many, many times, millions of times at the end of the three months of computation time. And I got an index of robustness. So I can show you several indexes, but this time I will show you the size of the largest network in the brain that is still connected. So even though you got 13 lesions, the network is still there and can properly work. So if you correlate that, which is the largest connected component, LCC, with full-scale IQ or performance IQ or verbal IQ, you see this. So it's a nice correlation between the way the brain can still properly function after lesions. These are basically the size of the network and the IQ. So it's this kind of results is suggesting that people with higher IQ can actually perform better, even if they can actually perform the same way, even if they remove 40 out of 100 region in your analysis, while people with lower IQ, they just drop even with 10 regions removed. So it it's really makes a, a difference. And if you try to map this region, you can also come out with a, an anatomical localization of the region that are, uh, support this kind of resilience in the brain. So why intelligence people, more intelligence people, so high IQ or low IQ, can afford more or less um, lesions. And if you look at the pattern of connectivity of this specific region, you see that there is maybe an explanation in the sense that people with higher IQ tend to have this region more connected at a, on an average level. So they are more connected with the other hemisphere and other networks. So this maybe is the way of the brain to use those weak connections. I'm not going to talk about that now, but we also have results showing that these connections are actually in part weak connections in the brain. And so you can actually drive the information there as soon as you lost these nodes. So the other region can compensate through this, this weak connection uh, network. And which was really cool, but I was so stupid that I put it in the supplementary materials. Uh, this should have been the first figure in the paper. That if you divide our sample of 130 subjects, I guess, uh, in high and low IQ, but also you divide, you divide them in decades, so different ages, you see here lower IQ, higher IQ, the largest connected component, you can see the color. So even though you remove the same amount of region in these two groups for each column, you can see that lower IQ subjects show a lower um, resilience as soon as you increase age. So at 61 to 70 years old, you have a huge difference in the way the brain can still cope and function when you remove the same amount of region, and it's the same here for random and targeted attack. So this is a huge difference in the way these two population, uh, and, and this maybe can be a factor in the cognitive reserve uh, idea and model, so why we can still uh, properly function here after, even though we are at 61 years old and we received the same amount of lesion. So this was another example. And just to summarize everything, we have a lot of uh, interesting findings, but we are still at the correlational level. So the idea is, okay, how can we integrate this and try to test some specific hypothesis to move forward? So my answer is non-invasive brain stimulation, clearly. And I think it will take like a couple of hours just to talk about this and explain uh, each type of approach in details. I don't know if you are familiar with this, but just to be sure, I will just spend two slides on this kind of approaches. Non-invasive brain stimulation is mainly composed by two families of approaches. You have transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is usually done with, there is a missing figure, but doesn't matter. A stimulator like this, so they're really costly, much harder. You need a neural navigation system to be really sure where you are actually stimulating in the brain. You can target like one centimeter in the brain or half a centimeter. You can use individual structural MRI to decide where you are actually stimulating in each subject in a, in a specific place. Or you can use transcranial electrical stimulation to modulate brain activity still at a non-invasive level. And, and um, you can try to do this with cheaper hardware like this, they really looks like this. They are just nine volt batteries. You have two sponge electrodes, even though there are fancier solution today, but basically you just induce these currents on the scalp and it just change membrane potentials. And you can actually modulate the 
probability that the brain will respond to stimuli or not. So you can increase or decrease corticospinal excitability. So these two approaches are all non-invasive brain stimulation, so you can easily do it as soon as you have the machine and you have the neural navigation system. What you can actually do is to try to target specific networks on the basis of the connectivity findings that you have and try to test the hypothesis that these connectivities are important. I can suppress the activity of this region now or increase it and see if you change when I test you at a cognitive level. So, but we will start with a couple of evidence about uh, electrical stimulation. Just to give you an idea, this is the amount of publication about TMS, which exploded in the mid-80s. Now we are moving towards electrical stimulation, so we have TDCS, direct current stimulation, alternating current stimulation, and uh, random, current, uh, random noise stimulation, and I think uh, Professor Kazubek will tell you something about this too. So I will just show you a couple of examples about TACS, which is the one that I prefer, and I try to use it to test my, my hypothesis. Uh, what's transcanal alter, uh, alternating current stimulation? Basically, you deliver a, uh, not a constant field to the brain, but an alternating field with a specific frequency and phase and intensity. So if you think about how the brain works, you know that with electroencephalography, we can record this potential from each regions in the brain, and the activity of different regions is expressed by activity in different frequency band. You have usually more beta, 20 hertz oscillation in your motor cortex, alpha or gamma in your visual cortex, theta in the hippocampus, and so on. So we know that, and the idea is that if this actually works, we can actually modulate this brain oscillation and increase this oscillation in following a very simple example like this, which is just an example. If you have this different neuronal population, the whole tends to fire at that frequency and phase, different moment, they have the peak of their oscillation, this one here, this one here, and so on. The result is this oscillation is one, two, three, four hertz, so four peaks that you can count, and the amplitude is really low. If you apply the same frequency from the outside with electrical stimulation, you can guide the brain, and you can try to align it to this kind of uh, stimulation pattern, so that the results will not be perfect, but some population will start to align with your external stimulation. And the result is the same frequency, but higher amplitude. So now you can think that if this oscillation is important for memory, and you know more or less when this oscillation is taking place when you do a digit span test, you can actually stimulate the subject with this in that region, and you can uh, expect the behavioral effect because you increase uh, theta, for example, in that specific subject. So this is uh, something that is really, really intriguing, I think, and the mechanisms are not really clear. This is just a summary of what we, we think is going on in the brain when you do that, um, which is really similar to what is going on in, when you tune your guitar and you try to make the different strings resonate one with each other. So basically, I just suggest here to, to read this very, very nice review about the topic. It's really, really simple and explain why this, this kind of uh, approach can work and modulate brain activity. The phenomenon is called entrainment. So basically you have one dominant oscillation in your brain, you apply another one from the outside, even though they are not synchronized at the beginning, through time they will start to align. And if they align your stimulation from the outside, you can control it. You can define the frequency, the amplitude, when you want to start it or stop it. And if the brain really follow that, you can decide when you have more theta here and then you switch to more alpha here and so on. During a task, during rest, and so on. So it's also cool because, as I said, we have more or less hypotheses about which are dominant frequencies in the brain for different regions. So now we can apply the stimulation to try to modulate something like fluid intelligence, for example. Like we did in 2013 when we published this paper about the modulation of fluid intelligence with TACS. So basically, we had a very simple hypothesis about a dominant role of the left middle frontal gyrus during um, an abstract reasoning task. So we decided to test different frequencies on this region. So we stimulate with five hertz, theta, alpha, beta, gamma, which was one of the main hypotheses, and a placebo stimulation. So you just feel stimulation at the very first beginning, like 10 seconds, and then it fades away. You do this during the task. When people are solving these different trials, which are relational or abstract reasoning, let's say logical trial, uh, we did it, this in 24 right-handed participants, and just keeping the, the parameters of the stimulation, what we were expecting was an increase in the performance during the task, not after. Uh, actually, we didn't test at the time for, for effect after the stimulation. And we were expecting for a frequency-specific uh, effect, so something maybe in gamma or maybe in theta, which are the two most uh, plausible oscillation related to this kind of processing. This is what we got. Surprisingly, 
we observe an effect only for logical trials when we stimulate the left middle prefrontal, uh, middle frontal gyrus, and we got a reduction in the reaction time of correct answers at the task, but only for logical trials and only for gamma stimulation. So gamma stimulation uh, was not inducing a change in the speed accuracy trade-off. We also clearly test for that. It was just changing the amount of time that you require to correctly resolve uh, a trial, uh, a fluid intelligence trial. So this was really surprising. It was also the first evidence at the time of the role of, causal role of gamma in the brain because we think that gamma oscillation are not uh, a real uh, effect or an epiphenomenon, just a summation of other frequencies. Uh, this time we show that if you induce it from the outside and you assume that you are increasing gamma in the brain and you see a behavioral effect, maybe gamma is doing something during this task. So then we replicate this, the, the, this finding with 64 uh, Oxford students collaborating with Roy Kadosh uh, in the UK. Basically, we replicate the finding, but the only important thing is here that um, start the conversation about uh, TMS is this. So when you actually look at who is going to respond to this brain stimulation or not, you see that out of these 64 subjects, you can basically define two subpopulations. You have subjects that were already doing uh, fine, before the stimulation, so they were really fast at solving the task, high accuracy, so these are the good performance performers. And then you have this 57% uh, of subjects that were actually uh, performing poorly before the task. So they were solving the task uh, with more or less the same accuracy, but they were uh, actually slower. So if you look at the effect of gamma stimulation on this population, here you have the enhancement that they get with gamma TACS. So here is no enhancement, zero. Here you increase the time that you need, um, so you decrease the time that you need to solve the task, here you increase it, and here you have the time that it takes you to solve the task before the stimulation. You see that there is a huge effect for people that were already slow before the stimulation, so all this group improve and the correlation is really high, so the slower you were before stimulation, the higher per enhancement you get with TACS. But for the other subject where they were already doing fine, they were able to solve the task, they were reasonably fast. Some of them actually got worse. And the one that improved, they didn't improve that much respect to this other group. So this suggests that maybe you cannot just apply the stimulation without thinking about who you are stimulating. Each brain is different from the other and we need to know a lot of information about brain oscillations, connectivity and so on to personalize this kind of approach. And so this is the question, how can we actually do that? How can we uh, study intelligence not just by stimulating one region and hoping that it's going to work or mis uh, measuring brain connectivity and, and see some uh, correlation. So the answer for us at least is uh, magnetic stimulation now. Why magnetic stimulation? Because respect to electrical stimulation, which is actually not focal at all, you put an electrode here, you're stimulating half of the brain basically. Even though there are people selling the idea that you can actually stimulate one gyrus uh, that's not true. You can do it though, uh, you, you can be really focal with transcranial magnetic stimulation. So basically it's this more or less the same principle. What you get in the brain is still electrical current, but it starts as a magnetic pulse, um, but basically go through uh, the scalp, through uh, the bone, and then when it reaches the CSF, the sp cerebral spinal fluid, it turns into electrical stimulation and it can really eat a small portion of the brain. To do this properly, you need neural navigation system and so on, but when you do it, you can actually get two, uh, two effects. The canonical TMS approach, you stimulate the motor cortex, for instance, and then you record something at the peripheral level, like on your hand. If I stimulate your motor cortex with enough stimulation intensity, I can actually elicit a twitch. So it's, you, you don't want to do it, but you will move your finger because you create a descending volley. And if I use uh, electromyography, I can measure the amplitude of this uh, response. And this actually correlates with the effect that I induce on the motor cortex. What we are trying to do now is to combine TMS with EEG, electroencephalography. So basically, instead of looking at the effect at the peripheral level, you put electrodes on your uh, scalp and you record this TMS evoked potential. So you still see an effect right after the pulse that lasts for a few hundred milliseconds, and it's clearly different for each electrode. It's not the same underneath the stimulation point or here or here. So basically, you are multiplying the effect by one output on your hand to all the electrodes that you can put your, on your scalp. And you can have a very, very nice representation of, after each pulse, you usually deliver 150 pulse, and then we do the average, how your brain reacts. And now we can start testing those ideas about resilience, how the brain reacts to perturbation, and so on, at the millisecond 
uh, time uh, scale. So here we can really measure what happened in the first 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, after one second, and so on. If I stimulate this region and I measure it here, local effect, or here, distant effect, contralaterally, so, and so on. So it's a really nice tool. And when I started to work on this, I started collaborating with Marcello Massimini in Italy, which published a very nice paper in science, translational medicine, I think two years ago, three years ago, when he basically showed for the first time that this technique is really valuable if you want to study consciousness. When you have people in uh, minimally conscious state or vegetative state, you really don't have that much information about how you can distinguish these two states. You cannot talk with these people, they don't react. So you need something at the electrophysiological level. And if you look at the EEG, they are not that different, just resting EEG. So by doing this instead, it shows that right after the TMS pulse, you measure all these potentials, and they actually have their own topography. So you can see that you stimulate here, you have a potential here, then it moves to the other hemisphere, then goes back, and so on. So you can map this time course, this movie, of how the information is spreading right after each pulse. And this kind of, the complexity of this response, if the pulse stay there, it's a very simple response, or if it goes to the other hemisphere or other lobe, basically it's a good, very reliable predictor of consciousness. For the first time, you have an idea of how to discriminate consciousness. So they call this uh, complexity of the signal. Uh, it, th these are very complicated graphs, but the main story is that if you look at people during wakefulness or anesthesia or sleep, you can see that the way their brain responds is completely different. So they also test different uh, drugs like midazolam or oxenone and propofol to induce anesthesia. So the brain of these people were really different when you send the pulse. If you send the pulse and you um, have propofol in your brain and your body, basically the response just stay there. It doesn't spread. The brain is just really anesthetized and you cannot really move information anywhere. And when he did it in minimally conscious state subjects and vegetative states, they were able to discriminate different classes for the first time. So now you go to the bed of the patients, you use TMSCG, and you have an index that is really reliable and can discriminate these conditions. So my idea, uh, talking with Massimini, was, okay, can I actually discriminate in cognitive profile or intelligence across individuals using this kind of approach? I talk about connectivity, uh, intelligence, resilience, but I always run simulations. Can I actually stimulate the subject and see how the signal spread to other electrodes, for example? So it was a huge effort. I don't suggest you to do this. It's a nightmare. Each session is like six hours. Then you need structural and functional MRI, another full cognitive evaluation, two hours, three hours, another day. You need all this machinery, a lot of uh, euros or dollars. But we did it. So we did a reasonable study because usually the average is 10, 15 subjects, 20 subjects. I want to have something to be to run a correlation, let's say. So 42 LT controls, we did all this stuff, and we stimulated six different regions. Uh, angular gyrus, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, and so on. Everything is individualized. So we do the MRI before, we determine the specific gyrus in your brain that they want to eat. Then I have this neural navigation system, like the one that you use for neurosurgery, that guide you the coil and tell you when to stop to stimulate that region. So if you do that, you get something like this. So you get the response right after the pulse. Uh, basically at 20 milliseconds, for example, 70 milliseconds, 120 milliseconds, when you stimulate the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. I'm not going to show you all the results for all the sites because it's, it's, it's a nightmare. This is just one frequency band, one site. If you split the subjects, with, uh, you create a composite cognitive score and you take lower um, level of this composite, uh, cognitive score or higher level, you see that there is a difference. So when you stimulate here, you see that the first response is still a local response, so the brain responds underneath the stimulation site. There is a burst of activity. In this case, it's gamma activity. So you have this burst, the neurons fire all of a sudden because you stimulate them. Then people with the lower cognitive score basically tend to stay there. They increase the number of populations that are recruited. It spread a bit. Then it goes to the temporal lobe bilaterally, come back there, then the temporal lobe. If you look at high, uh, let's say, cognitive composite score, you see a local response, then it just disappears, you move away. It's really an, a connected brain. It goes there, activate another network, it increases, go contralaterally, come back here with a huge pattern, then goes to another one, and so on. This is just a rough estimate of what's going on in the brain, but you can see that clearly we, we, we run a lot of other combination of subjects. We randomized, uh, uh, create groups, 
uh, and we test for differences. This is, this is significant, and you can see that maybe this is the same thing that Massimini was saying, so an, an index of integration versus segregation. So you have people that tend to stay there, and the brain is not prone to share this information with anybody else, and in this case, it's more, it's more distributed. At the frequency level, so basically, Massimini's group, again, is doing an amazing job in this field, basically demonstrated that if you stimulate different brain regions, you don't always get the same effect in terms of frequency. As I said before, we would expect a bigger effect for beta on the motor cortex, alpha on the occipital cortex, when you record the EEG. What if you stimulate this region? You should still see neurons uh, that tends to fire at that frequency because that's the natural frequency of that region. Indeed, when they were stimulating the occipital cortex, parietal cortex, or more or less prefrontal cortex, they were getting these responses. So the longer response, it's um, basically uh, what you would expect. In the occipital cortex is around 11 hertz, so alpha, then beta in the motor cortex, and gamma in the prefrontal cortex. So the brain of this subject, just seven subjects, uh, tends to elicit the pattern that is more dominant for them, it's more natural. So what they would engage in uh, during a task, for example, or when you just ask the brain to do something. So my idea uh, was, okay, if I stimulate one region, can I actually explain this variability that we observed in the other paper? Why people respond to gamma stimulation or not? Maybe they have a different gamma to begin with. So if I record with EEG, I cannot see the difference. Next level, I think I have enough five minutes or 10 minutes. Yeah, okay. So, oh, yeah. Do I have five minutes, 10 minutes? Okay, sorry. <laughs> the couple mafia, okay. That sounds familiar to me. And so <laughs> the idea here is, okay, we can measure uh, connectivity, we have TMS, we have TSES, we can actually modify connectivity, so can we actually use these approaches to study intelligence and to improve intelligence? So another cool way to use TMS is this. It's from another Italian group. We, it seems we are doing good stuff in this, in this field lately. It's from Giacomo Koch in Rome and Domenica Veniero in Glasgow. So basically, if you use two stimulation coils instead of one, and you have an hypothesis about two regions that you want to be more connected after stimulation, you can use this pattern when you send a stimuli to the first region and a stimuli to the second one with a very brief interval, like five milliseconds. You use two neural navigation systems, two stimulators, and so on. You trigger the pulses, and you create what is called Hebbian plasticity, so spike time independent plasticity. When you do this for like 200 pulses or 100 pulses, and you measure cortical excitability or the connectivity between these two regions after stimulation here, pre, post, you see that depending on the timing, plus five or minus five, so you invert the timing, you stimulate the second one first and then the other, you have an increase in the connectivity or a decrease. So this was really surprising. This is pretty new. There are publications from the last seven or eight years, I guess. And, but this is fantastic. If you think about, we can understand maybe the correlates of intelligence at the connectivity level. We can use stimulation. We can increase one connectivity that we think is relevant. Then we measure intelligence, maybe it's increased. And it's not like, I mean, I love cognitive training. We are doing a lot. But here we are actually interacting directly with neurons and creating plasticity. So with cognitive training, you need several sessions. Here maybe you can see an effect after two, and it will last for weeks. So it can be really something. The last thing I'm going to show you is this, is the results that we are still uh, trying to publish, which I think is really cool. It's, it's, the, it's the other factor that I'm trying to put into this equation of the neuroscience of intelligence. So it's a modeling work we are doing with mathematicians in Boston and, and, and Siena, when basically we use evolutionary game theory to explain these connectivity patterns in the brain, so brain oscillation. We know that we have this brain oscillation, like this blue one, or maybe the red one is the real data, the red one. What they showed me the first time we met is that when they apply this evolutionary gain theory model to data, just random networks, they got oscillation too. So the way uh, each node or, or subpopulation tend to inhibit or excite other population and so on, create a pattern that is like this, you got oscillation. So when we apply that model to our fMRI data, we got something like this. So the simulation is the blue one, the real data is the red one. So we were really close, even at the first attempt. We were almost able to simulate brain activity in real time. But this was not enough, so we thought this was the wrong way to, to go. So we just downscaled the problem, and we just tried to capture connectivity pattern like the matrix I showed you before. So you can see here the real data, when basically you have the data from these two networks, the blue one and the red one. 
And you can see that the connectivity inside this network, composed by four regions, four by four, is the red one. And then the other one with seven region is the blue one. So they are highly positively connected inside each network and negatively connected with the other. So they tend to be segregated. Each network wants to do its stuff, but not talk with the other. It's not important, it's not relevant. So this is the network that we got when we simulate this brain. So it really looks the same. So this was really, really impressive. And you look at simulation in the future, basically. You don't stop at the same time when the real data stop, but you try to simulate the, what the brain is going to do after that. You have the original data, seven minutes, the simulated data for the first seven minutes, and then you have seven to 14, 21 minutes, and so on. So you see, it's not always the same. There are tiny variations. So the brain continues to fluctuate, and it's different for each brain, for each individual. The most important thing is then, then you can try to do something that in the real world we cannot do, I mean, unless you want to get fired. You cannot create legions, that's not good. But you can create it in this model. If it's a reliable model, I can eliminate one region, for example, the number four, and then I can try to see how the network rearranges the connectivities in real time. So when you remove this one, you see that the first network start to be super highly correlated, and also the second one is a reaction of the network. You remove this one, they start to talk with each other. They don't want to share information anymore. And then it changed through time. You lost the first one, it really disappeared mostly. The second one starts to show something. So this is really cool, but what happened? Again, just to finish this presentation. That's the idea. So instead of just looking at brain connectivity and correlated with intelligence, now we have very, very cool tools looking for brain stimulation and modeling. So we can try to get ideas from here, test it with a model that allow to go beyond the real data that you cannot manipulate, unless you use brain stimulation and you can stimulation quite. So you can try to uh, work with these three factors Clearly, this is not just my work, otherwise I would be dead now. It's a, it's a huge team, both in Boston and, and Siena. And, but it seems we can simulate a lot of stuff, stimulate the brain, change the brain, but let's always keep in mind this. Probably we are not actually looking at uh, the overall picture, and we will not be able to look at the overall picture. So let's try to be modest and humble. I, I get excited talking about this stuff, but then I look at this monkey and I say, yeah, he's pretending to use the camera, but he doesn't know what he's doing. That's me. So...